From 2008 to 2011, she lived in London and worked as a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and then at the Sustainable Development Unit. Her main interest is in sustainable healthcare and in March 2014, she will commence a PhD on this topic at the University of Canberra. Kate has facilitated small group workshops on climate change, sustainability and health with more than 300 health professionals, both here in Australia, in New Zealand and in the UK. And she's developed a comprehensive and useful resource for those of us wanting to communicate about the links between climate change and health. Um, thank you, Kate. Okay, thank you, Dimity. Um, so in 2009, I was living in London and I landed my dream job. Um, the previous year, a new national unit had been set up within the NHS, the National Health Service, um, in the UK. And this unit was called the Sustainable Development Unit, or the SDU. And it had been established with the aim of helping the NHS to become a leading low-carbon organisation. Um, now, this wasn't an insignificant task. The NHS is the fourth largest organisation in the world, after the Chinese Army, the Indian Railways, and Walmart. Um, <laughs> so it was quite an ambitious undertaking. Um, and this unit, the SDU, has subsequently done some really innovative things. Um, and in my view, at least, is probably the group that has progressed this agenda more than any other group in the world. Um, and so I thought that today it would be, since we don't have anything like this in Australia, not yet, anyway, um, I thought that it would be useful to hear about what they're doing in the UK. Um, and in particular, there's uh, three things that i just um, like to cover. Firstly, and just very briefly, this unit, the SDU. Um, secondly, uh, the carbon footprinting um, exercise that they have done and the scale of the change that is required, which is really about transformational change. Um, and lastly, what I've called pockets for the future, um, pockets of the future in the present. And this is, if you think about what healthcare might look like in 10, 15, 20 years' time, these are things that are starting to happen now, which might uh, in the future be quite mainstream. So I've just got a couple of examples of those types of things. Okay, so the SDU is a, a small unit. It's literally seven or eight staff. Um, it's based in Cambridge in the UK. Um, and as I said, whilst it was initially set up within the NHS, um, it, its role in the last year or two has uh, recently been um, expanded. So it now covers, as you can see there, the public health and the social care system um, as well. Um, and whilst there were some uh, political and, I guess, some funding reasons for this, it also fits in really nicely with... Um, this move in the UK now towards integration, that is, uh, integration of the health and social care systems. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later as well. Um, and so the SDU, faced with this initial task of reducing the, the carbon emissions of the NHS, um, the first thing they figured that they needed to do was to understand where those emissions were coming from, so what their starting point was. Um, and so the first major piece of work that they did was to measure the carbon emissions of the entire NHS in England. And they've now done this. Um, so the SDU was formed in 2008, so it's now in its seventh year. And they have now done this footprinting exercise about four times every couple of years. And this data, which I'm about to show, is the most recent data. It came out in January of this year. Um, uh, and this is it. So um, this data, and those of you who've seen SDU publications before, will notice that this is a little bit different. So this data relates not only to the NHS, as it was previously, but now to the, the, the um, public health and social care systems as well. Okay? Um, and so the carbon emissions of the health and social care system in 2012 in England was 32 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. Does anyone have a sense of how much that is? Okay, it's a, that's enormous. That's more than the emissions from a medium-sized country. Okay, so these are significant numbers. And if you look at the figure on the right, the pie graph, that 32 million tonnes is broken down into its sort of main constituent parts. So the, the yellow section, 13%, is travel. So that's patient, staff and visitor travel. 15% um, is building energy use. So that's sort of air conditioning, heating and cooling and so on. Um, and then the biggest section by far was 72% procurement. 
So they're things that the, the, these systems, these things that they buy, goods and services. Um, and then the figure on the left shows the constituent parts of that 72%. Um, so you can see there that if you ignore sort of the, the green bar, which is um, health services commissioned outside the system, then by far the biggest, uh, the tallest bar is that 5.6, which is on 5.6 million tonnes, which is pharmaceuticals. Um, and then the next two are medical services and equipment and business services, which are the yellow and orange ones. So these are the things that the, the SDU, SDU is now re referring to as carbon hotspots. And these are obviously the areas that are going to require particular attention. Okay. Um, so this exercise helped them to understand where they were at, at that time or where they are now. The next slide is about where they're going. Um, and we used to call this graph the ski slope graph. And I'll just talk you through this. So on the x-axis you've got year, so it starts at 1990 and goes up to 2050. On the y-axis you've got um, the carbon emissions for the health and social care systems. And the units there are um, millions of tonnes of CO2 equivalent. So you can see that that figure of 32 million tonnes that I just gave you puts us um, up there at the intersection of those dark blue and red lines. That's where we're at the moment. Um, so the dark blue line are the emissions up to date, to sort of 2012. Um, the light blue line is the trajectory. And then those red and then orange lines are the targets. Okay? So those points on the orange line are the targets set in accordance with the Climate Change Act of 2008. So in the UK, they actually have legislation which mandates carbon reduction. And under that act, the end target um, is 80% on 1990 levels. That's why it starts at 1990, by 2050. So that's sort of consistent with what Tim was just saying. That's the sort of the reduction that's required. That's what's legislated in the UK. OK, so you can see where we are now. And you can see that perhaps in the last few years, it could be argued that some progress has been made. But the really interesting part about this graph is that big orange line. So what this tells us about the scale of the change is that this is going to be an enormous challenge. This is not going to be achieved by changing a few light bulbs and staff cycling to work. This is actually going to require tra quite radical transformation of the healthcare system. Okay? And so whilst it is important to do the active travel pl plans and look at energy efficiency and those other things, we really need to be thinking big um, for the future of healthcare. Okay, which um, brings me to that third thing that I wanted to talk about, which was pockets of the future in the present. Okay. So a couple of years ago, the SCU commissioned, um, well, was involved in a project called Fit for the Future. Um, and in that project, they, along with a number of their other partners, um, got together and, and put together four scenarios about what the NHS might look like in 2030. I don't have time to show, and there was, sorry, four videos based on those scenarios. I don't have time to show one of those videos now, but instead I just wanted to provide a couple of examples of the, the types of things that, that might have been in those scenarios. Um, and the first one's about pharmaceuticals. So you remember from that bar graph that obviously pharmaceuticals was an area, it's carbon hotspots, an area that requires particular attention. Um, so the SCU got together with a number of their partners um, and along with um, some pharmaceutical companies. And you can see them listed there on the bottom of the slide. Um, and they had a series of roundtable discussions. And the first thing that they um, decided that they needed to do, that they needed, was to have some transparent guidelines on how pharmaceutical products were, the, sorry, the carbon emissions of pharmaceutical products were measured and reported. And so um, after a year or two, um, a year or two of work, this um, document was produced, and this came out in November in 2012. And in these, it's about a 100-page document altogether, but in these guidelines, that's what they've come up with. These are consistent, transparent guidelines about how the carbon emissions for each pharmaceutical product has to be measured and then reported. And whilst that sounds a bit boring, um, if you think about it, this really sets up a level sort of playing field for the future, um, in that from now on, people will very quickly be able to identify what the carbon emissions of a particular product are 
and therefore they could use those, um, that information to make comparisons between different products and even to inform procurement decisions. Um, and so this is quite a, a very useful document and certainly one, I mean, obviously given the nature of the pharmaceutical industry, this is an international document. So this is something potentially that we could use in Australia. Um, the other problem with pharmaceuticals is wastage. And in England, they estimate it costs them about 300 million pounds a year um, on, they spend on pharmaceuticals that are ne never even used or opened. Um, and so one model that has been put forward um, was for recycling of medications. So under this model, patients uh, would be able to return medications to the pharmacist or to the hospital, um, and they would, the pharmacists or other staff would in some way check these for safety and would check that they're still within their use-by date, but given those requirements, they would be able to redispense those to other patients. So should we have a show of hands? Who here would be willing to swallow a recycled pill? I think you guys did better than the, than the UK public. So the SDU commissioned a poll um, on this, um, in which they um, polled members of the general public, and just over, about 52% of people said they would be willing to accept it, and about 20% of people were a definite no. So there's a quite a lot sitting on the fence, a bit different from the show of hands we just had. So I, I guess this is, a one, this is a case of watch this space. On that one. Okay, and then on my final slide, I just wanted to mention um, that this is the strategy that's been the, the most recent strategy to come out of the SDU. This is for the next six years, from 2014 to 2020. Um, it's called Sustainable, Resilient, Healthy, Healthy People and Places. Um, and it's the, in the executive summary, they talk about this is how we, this is our sort of strategy for setting out how we can continue to provide quality health care within carbon limits and build much more sustainable and resilient communities. Um, and there's five modules which underpin the strategy. Um, and amongst those modules, there are the, the usual suspects. There's one on carbon hotspots, for instance. But there's a couple with quite um, sort of different titles. And one of them is about sustainable, resilient um, communities. And there's another one that's to come out next year that's called Building Social Capital. And this ties in with this idea around integration. And uh, very simply, integration of health and social care. Um, and very simply, the, the idea around this is that um, evidence shows that communities which are, are really resilient and have very high levels of social capital um, have, the best, have much better health outcomes and have therefore have less reliance on, on health care. Um, and this is sort of an idea and move that's gaining a lot of traction in the UK. Under the NHS reforms of 2012, they established health and wellbeing boards, which are boards which are going to be responsible for this, um, this integration. Um, and so I think that's another um, example of something that we should be watching with interest to see how that evolves. Um, and just, yeah, and just very finally, I guess the favourite, um, under the strategy, one of my favourite modules is one that's called, simply called innovation. And I guess that's sort of in recognition of there are things that will be happening in, in 2020, which is only six years away, that we haven't even thought about yet. Okay. Oh, thanks. Oh, the question. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. So we're ready for some questions for Kate. Um, just while the microphone's going, perhaps to Peter Tate here with the, his hand up. Um, I just mentioned that Kate's running a workshop this afternoon. Oh, yeah. okay. So that if anyone is really interested in this topic would like to come along, um, it's very worthwhile. Yeah. I've been to one myself. Um, Peter, thanks. Okay, Kate, okay, thanks. Uh, this is slightly off tangential, but how do you do enormous radical change? What's the thinking that the SDU's got behind how you do that? Well, easy question, Peter. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, I think there are num that you have to have a number of strategies, a number of reasons. One of the things that I think they've done really well is, and one of the most useful things about this agenda is that a lot of the things in healthcare which are very carbon intensive are also the most expensive things. And if you look at the healthcare system here or in the UK or pretty much anywhere, the current model is simply not sustainable. It's not sustainable financially and it's not sustainable environmentally either. But whilst those two things go hand in hand, what a lot of health service managers and politicians are interested in is money. So if you can prove, if you can demonstrate by good research and do the numbers and say, you know, in, in many cases what we're doing is going to be beneficial on both those two counts in the future, 
then you get a lot of traction. But you have to have a number of strings to your bow. That's one of them. You know, building reputational examples, selling positive uh, stories of success, doing things on a small basis and then showing that they work, um, getting the staff engaged, um, because this, the frontline staff are the ones who are making day-to-day -day decisions, getting them involved in having their ideas, um, you know, as well as building a science base, an environmental sustainability base um, of science. But all those things need to be taken into account. And you need different... When you're speaking to different people and trying to engage different people, you need to understand where they're coming from and, and target your message appropriately. So some people are interested in money, some people are interested in health effects, those sort of things. So you have to have, I think, a range of strategies. Be my answer. We have another question for Kate. Um, Helen? Possibly two. Um, we'll see how we go. Um, the first one is regarding um, the great concentration of expenditure in healthcare that occurs in a person's last six months of their life. And I'm just wondering if advanced care planning uh, is part of their strategy. Certainly, we're doing it here in Australia, as you probably know. And the second question is about I'm fascinated by the um, pharmaceutical. Uh, carbon footprint, and we have so many problems related to polypharmacy, people on too many tablets for too long, and poor Tim on his antihypertensive for the rest of his life, and nobody's ever going to review it. That's a nightmare. Because uh, <laughs> I treat people with, um, you know, falls from too many tablets all the time. So is that also um, something that you're going to be... Oh, something that the NHS is doing? Absolutely. So on the second count um, about pharmaceuticals, the reason, one of the reasons why the pharmaceuticals are such a high carbon footprint is because if you think about the whole process that's involved, research and development, manufacture, distribution, transport, wastage, that's why it's so high. Absolutely, I mean, recycling is one idea, but absolutely, I couldn't agree more, Helen, about prescribing practices. Um, polypharmacy is one problem. Antibiotic resistance is another. I mean, there's a whole range of reasons why we doctors need to be prescribing better and medications need to be reviewed much more much more often. So I, I couldn't agree more on that. Um, and that's part of, again, that's a part of a suite of things. Recycling is one thing and those things are others. Um, on your first point, which was about advanced care planning, the short answer is the SDU is not directly involved in that, but they, they certainly, it's certainly obvious, it's um, obviously a key area in which they would strongly encourage. But the, I mean, the SDU, as I said, is it's a small unit. Seven or eight staff, they can't do a lot themselves. But the, they, the idea is that others, you know, geriatricians and palliative care and, and clinicians should be involved in that and could seek support or help from the SDU as appropriate. But people, you know, those the most relevant groups would need to be um, leading that, I guess. But yeah, totally agree as well on that count. It's something that needs to be. And um, GPs also, um, in the UK, a lot of them are involved in a, a good death, they call it now, as well. So there are a few... Um, I think there is a bit going on in that space, yes. Thank you. Um, I think Lynn, is that right? Thanks, Kate. Um, it's always great to have an update on the SDU. The thing that, um, in ref reference to Peter's um, observation about what helped them to affect transformational change, um, and, and that was coming back to our last, uh, not our last speaker, but to the, to the minister. I mean, effectively, as Kate alluded, uh, has said, uh, there is legislation in place. Um, that legislation uh, drive was led by the Prime Minister. The change that's going on in the NHS is going across all sectors. So um, basically, the, the government recognised the problem, I uh, think, post Bali, and actually put the legislative change in place to enable change and then charged their various um, um, government sectors to make the change happen. And as Kate says, it's a small team, but they've been enabled by um, government legislation and a government environment. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Uh, yes, we've got just time for two more, just those two before. Hi, Kate. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I was just wondering about um, your thoughts on medical waste. Um, there's a lot of situations in medicine where 
to maintain sterility and infection control. A lot of our equipment and so on is single use and it's almost more um, economically viable just to throw it away and use another one than to like autoclave it and clean it. Um, do you think there's a way in which we can reduce this wastage um, while still maintaining like our current levels of sterility and, and healthcare? Um, Forbes, do you want to answer that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> we, is that something you'll be covering tomorrow? Or? Yeah. So yeah. I, that um, Forbes, Forbes McGain is an anaesthetist and intensivist. He'll be speaking tomorrow, and he's much more, he knows much more about that than I will, so I'll defer to Forbes on that. <laughs> but, yes, short, I think so. Yes, short answer. And there was just one more question up there, I think. Hello, Kate. Um, Miff Appleton. I was just wondering uh, whether you see a specific role or um, several specific roles for people involved in healthcare in communicating uh, sustainability and communicating climate change on a wider sort of sphere, other than just within the hospitals, but within um, Australia and society. Yeah, I mean, I do. I think as doctors, you sign up to um, help your patients, but part of that is um, improving the, the social and the, and the environmental and the sort of economic situations for your parents, for your patients, because we know that all those things impact greatly on people's health. So yes, I do think this is this is a responsibility for clinicians, but it's also a tremendous opportunity because a lot of the things that we're advocating. It was alluded to earlier with the obesity sort of idea. A lot of the things we're advocating for are good for our patients' health and good for the environment as well. So it's not something that's antagonistic. You know, this is actually. Kill, kill two birds with one stone type thing. So, yes, I do think we have a role and I think it's a great opportunity for us as well. Uh, okay, actually, I think we've got time for one, very one more last question. You can use a very large voice, though. Yeah, I'll just microphones shout are um, I know the dichotomy is different between public and private in the UK, but has anyone looked at the various uh, incidents and problems and what the relevant costs and wastes are in the system? The question's about the, uh, in Australia, we obviously have a lot of private healthcare, is that what you're meaning? Uh, whereas in the, U in the UK, it's um, more public. Right. You do see a big difference in, and yeah. much less waste in private. Has there been research into that in the, in the UK? Uh, not that I'm aware of. No, the, I mean, in the US, there's lots of good things going on, and a lot of that is uh, uh, it's driven by private companies and private healthcare. So. But I've done, I don't know specific examples in the UK of that sort of comparison, no. Okay. okay, well, thank you. I'd like everyone to join me in thanking Kate. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.